Pikmin 4 is less than a month away. It's been nearly a decade since Pikmin 3 released on the Wii U, and since then, Nintendo's ambition for the series, along with its engine, have had some monumental shifts. Pikmin 4 looks to take the top-down perspective of the first three games all the way down to ground level, giving players a new perspective on the treasure hunting management franchise. Of course, along with this shift comes new challenges. This is by far the most visually and technologically ambitious Pikmin game that Nintendo has ever produced. And understanding that hurdle is key context for Pikmin 4. One of the advantages of the limited camera of the first three Pikmin games was it provided the developers with an easy-to-manage render budget. At any given time, there was a firm limit on what you could expect the player to see. No matter how big the level, players were always looking down into a small, fixed portion of it. This also allowed for a lot of rendering tricks. If a player couldn't conceivably move their camera to see a portion of geometry, then that geometry didn't need to exist. For example, the undersides of large structures. This allowed Pikmin 3 in particular to really push the hardware of the Wii U to make an absolutely beautiful game that ran well and presented crisp, clean visuals. Giving the player full camera control in Pikmin 4 is more than just a gameplay change. It's a huge technical challenge, and likely why Pikmin 4 shifts away from the proprietary engine used for Pikmin 3 and into the more established Unreal Engine. Even then, Unreal itself has had mixed results on Switch, even from Nintendo's own first-party published titles. So how does Pikmin 4 manage? Well, thanks to the free demo which released this week, we can finally take a look. I should of course note that this is a demo, and may not exactly reflect launch day code. Pikmin 4 is doing quite a bit, from a technical perspective. Perhaps the most striking is its aggressive use of a shallow depth of field. This gives the impression that you're viewing a very small object, which for Pikmin, fits very well. Drop the camera low to the ground, and you'll see distant objects fade into a nice bokeh depth of field effect. Near camera blur is handled similarly to what we saw in The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening on Nintendo Switch, another Unreal Engine title. Rather than using any actual depth calculation, near camera blur is simply imitated using a mask that covers the very bottom of the frame and curves up into the lower corners. Its more limited screen real estate compared to what was in Link's Awakening makes the effect much more subtle and to my eyes, much more palatable. Every single shadow in the game is real-time, with no evidence of any pre-baked shadows as far as I can tell. That means as you spend your day exploring, you'll see those shadows slowly creep along the ground. Shadow quality is also quite good, at least near to the camera. If you look off into the distance, you'll of course notice the drop-off as shadows transition to a lower resolution. Shadows for smaller, dynamic objects in the environment are also culled out completely beyond a certain point while the larger shadows cast by world geometry remain. Detail pop-in in general makes arguably its first appearance in Pikmin 4. Once again, that locked-off top-down camera essentially eliminated the need for obvious LODs in the previous games. But here you will notice both texture and geometry pop-in as you run around. I found it most obvious in small bits of foliage, though overall, it's not bad. One thing I didn't notice was any sort of real-time ambient occlusion. In a game like this, full of fine geometric detail and lots of nooks and crannies, ambient occlusion to fill in the corners of the world with shade would look fantastic. Even a simple screen space approach, as we saw in both Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, would really add a lot of depth. Its absence isn't as harshly felt as it is in something like Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, but it would have been a wonderful addition. Finally, we also get some nice, if a bit low resolution, screen space reflections on all water surfaces. It's not the best implementation I've seen, even on Switch, but they generally do a great job of blending with the fallback cube maps and simply sitting in the scene, adding some nice life without being full of artifacts and leading to a lot of distraction. All in all, it's a pretty impressive feature set. So what does this mean for performance? Well, on the frame rate side of things, we're looking at a 30 frames per second target, which is no real surprise given the feature set we're dealing with. While we're only able to test a single area in this demo, I didn't pick up on any significant drops in my testing. No matter how many Pikmin I center on the map to do different tasks, the game just cruised on effortlessly. Resolution, on the other hand, appears to be dynamic. 
I had a hard time getting exact resolution counts due to whatever upscaling is being made use of. It does a nice job of smoothing out edges in most cases, but it does resolve a slightly soft looking image. From what counts I could get, I've counted a range of 1472 by 820 down to 1280 by 720. I'm guessing the actual top end resolution is probably targeting 900p, but I never actually counted that specific number. It just seems likely. Handheld resolution looks to be in the range of 540p, but I've had even more trouble counting the resolution there, so I'll wait to make any final judgments on handheld resolution. Pikmin 4 is a very technically ambitious game, and perhaps more so than one might first suspect. The trade-off is, of course, resolution, but it's far from the lowest we've seen on Switch, and it feels appropriate given how the game is presenting its world. Of course, there is much more of that world to see. We've only had a taste of Pikmin 4 so far. So keep an eye on Nintendo World Report for more continuing coverage on Pikmin 4 and beyond. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing, and if you have any questions for me, you can feel free to give me a shout on Twitter using the handle on screen. You can also join our Discord using the link in the description, and check out NintendoWorldReport.com for a whole lot more. My name's John Raird, and thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time. This video was made possible by our generous supporters on Patreon. Did you know that Nintendo World Report is funded directly by fans like you? When you support Nintendo World Report on Patreon, you get immediate access to multiple exclusive podcasts every month, exclusive Discord channels, an early look at select content, and more. All for as little as a dollar a month. Check out patreon.com slash nwr for all the details.